In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain Report comes from the book of Daniel. We're going to continue the series that we started in the book of Daniel. And for those of you who may not have caught every part of it, it's a story that I'm sure you're familiar with. The king commands Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to worship at the feet of this idol. They refuse. As punishment, he throws them into the fiery furnace. And the one that we, the passage that we just looked at is after they have come out, they realize that they have not been hurt by the fire and that they have not even been affected by the fire. And this is how the king reacts to it. For this, we go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 28 through 30. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so, that, uh, so as to not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the providence of Babylon. The reason that this particular part of the story is so moving and important is because it shows the change that God's power has in the life of this king, someone that doesn't know God, has been a pagan his entire life. He now understands, and granted, this is a lesson, unfortunately, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to have to learn and relearn and unlearn. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar is a very inconsistent figure in the scripture, but at least in the immediate aftermath of seeing this miracle, he seems to be very convicted that he understands that God really is the one that is in control. Now, he's already seen Daniel interpret dreams, and as amazing as that was, this is something where he can see actual physical evidence of a miracle taking place. And because of that, he is really astounded. And this is about as big a turnaround as you could ever have. We see Nebuchadnezzar beforehand saying anybody that doesn't worship my god and my idol they will be punished and they'll be thrown into a furnace to going so far the opposite way saying anybody that even disrespects the god of shadrach meshach and abednego is going to suffer my wrath now to be fair granted this is a horrible thing if you're talking about freedom of religion but you know ancient babylon didn't exactly have a first amendment at the time so this is the decree that the king makes he goes from mocking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God to having the utmost respect for him and saying anybody that does mock is going to face the penalty for doing so. So he does a complete 180 here. And I would say that in the larger biblical narrative, Nebuchadnezzar is somebody that seems to be a pretty impulsive man. His beliefs seem to sway to and fro very quickly, and so he is sort of prone to these big sweeping changes. But the point is, even though this change may be impulsive and we're going to see later that he stops respecting God and, and stops revering him as he did when he saw the miracle of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we do see that the power was enough to convict him, if, the, if nothing else, just in this moment of how powerful God is in comparison to him. And one thing that I wanted you to notice too is that he says that there is no God that is able to deliver like this. And this is something where some cultural context really comes in handy. Because the vast majority of pagans, of which Nebuchadnezzar was one, their beliefs were sort of that there are lots of gods, and there are so many gods that we don't even know how many they are. And they kind of believed that the gods were either incapable or unwilling to actually meddle in the affairs of man. And let's be honest, the reason for that was pretty clear. 
the reason that they believed those things is because they had never seen a God that could actually do something. We see this countless times in the Bible where people were worshiping things that weren't God, and then God shows how powerless and how empty these handmade idols, these things that are designed and worshipped by men but don't actually exist, are. And you see here an example that the pagans themselves didn't even really believe that their gods were all that powerful. We saw earlier in this same passage that Nebuchadnezzar said, what God is there that can deliver you? In other words, this is not a guy who's an atheist. He believed in other gods. He just didn't believe that there was a God powerful enough to stop his will. He didn't believe that there existed a God that was going to be able to save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he wasn't saying there are no gods. He was just saying there's not a God that's actually powerful enough to stop me from doing what I want. And so it's a very, very different mindset than what we have today. And now he realizes not only is there a God that can stop him, there is a God that is so much more powerful than him that he needs to pay reverence to him. And he believes that his nation needs to do the same thing. So at least for some time, God was revered in the nation of Babylon because of this great miracle that the king witnessed. And I do want to point to verse 30 as well, that God had them prosper in this land. That after this, because of the show of faith where they said, no, I will not worship any God other than the true God. And if it costs us our life, it costs us our life. If it means we have to die for this, so be it. That's the kind of conviction that God respects, and it seems, based on this, it's a conviction that Nebuchadnezzar respects as well. Because he went from thinking that they were crazy for even attempting to defy him in the name of their God to praising them for their defiance. Think about that. We see this in this passage. He is saying, man, it is amazing that they decided to defy me in service of their God, and their God rewarded their faith by sending his angel to protect them. That's Nebuchadnezzar's observation of the situation, and he's right. And so he respects their God now, and he also respects their faith. He respects the conviction that they had to say, no, this is wrong, and we're not going to do it no matter what you say. We are not going to cross that line. We are not going to defy our God. And Nebuchadnezzar really respects that out of them. And I think that that's an important thing to note, too, that we are going to gain respect and we are going to be able to prosper in a certain way. And I'm not a fan of the prosperity gospel. You know that. But our situations and what surrounds us is not as important as our faith. And even though Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in a position where it was not looking good for them, they were in a position where it looked like they were going to come into harm. And even though they were in a position that most Jews would have never wanted to be in, being taken away from their homeland, being taken away from the promised land, and put in a foreign nation surrounded by pagans, the faith and the strength of their conviction caused them to prosper in this land. And even though Nebuchadnezzar didn't really share their faith, or at least not the way that he should have, he did respect them. And if we as Christians do this, even when we're surrounded by people that don't share our faith in Christ, even when we're around people that do act immorally and don't share our common set of values, if people see you day in and day out, your coworkers, the people that you come in contact with every day, if they see the strength of your conviction and your faith, even if they don't agree, they will respect you. They'll respect the fact that you have enough faith to live your life differently than everybody around you. That's something that does encourage that kind of respect. And if that takes place, if that respect and that basis is there, then when they start asking questions, guess who they're going to come to? Having this conviction is important because people know that you are a person that takes your faith seriously. And if they ever have any questions about faith, if they ever have any questions about this God that you serve, they're going to go to you because they know you're the real deal. They know you're somebody that is serious about dedicating their life to following God. It's not just lip service for you. It's something that you actually live out, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if we live that kind of life, there's no telling how many people 
we can bring a little bit closer to God and understanding his will, just like they did with Nebuchadnezzar. Stay the course, friends. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus. But I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.